Hey guys, another episode of Hunkered Down with Seth. We got uh, an amazing comic, uh, finalist in the Seattle and San Francisco comedy competitions, as well as entertaining our troops three times overseas. The man, the myth, the pseudo-Canadian, Lars Calio. Lars, thank you for hey. being here. <laughs> yeah, Seth, how you been? Doing great. It's great talking to you. It's, I mean, I don't think I've talked to you in, you know, not in person, but just voice to voice about a good four years, maybe. That sounds accurate. I, um, I'm a big fan, and it's funny. I always, you always wonder if it's a forced association when it comes to like a podcast or an interview. But I can, I can say with the utmost sincerity that Seth is my friend and somebody who I'm always happy to interact with, so I'm happy to hear your voice again. Oh, wonderful. I wish the feeling was mutual. <laughs> so, now, Lars is great. The moment I met him, he's been the nicest, kindest, funniest dude and most caring. And uh, then I hear some of the road stories about him, and I get very confused. But... Uh, but no, Lars, amazing comic. Uh, how many years have you been uh, doing comedy? This May it'll be 17 years. 17 years. 2003. Uh, well, technically 17 yeah. years. Isn't it different? It's like 13 American because of the uh, metric system. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Exchange rate. Exchange rate means I've been doing it all. Just over a baker's dozen. Oh, perfect. <laughs> but... So, Lars, uh, a question I always ask any big ha comic I have on this uh, show, which has been going on for a good week and a half, what has been the craziest show you've ever been a part of? Oh, so I think there's a couple of different answers for that. I can think of the worst show I've ever done, which I will answer. I think the coolest show I've ever done, um, but I have been and this is going to sound cheesy, but I mean it, I have been the luckiest person in the world for the past 16 years. I, my, this job has taken me to 25 countries, and I've toured with some of the biggest headliners in the world, and um, has taken me to places I never imagined I'd go to. So the thing I'm most proud of in my career is really the five military tours that I've done. So I've done two for Canada and three for the U.S., and when you're in Baghdad, when you're in, you know, you're in some little military base on the border of Iran, Iraq, and you're entertaining these 50 soldiers who don't have running water, who, who've been eating MREs for six months, those moments are the moments that I look at and go, this is the coolest job in the world. Um, so probably I, this past December, I did a show at the North Pole or a Canadian military base up there. Oh, wow. Smaller. There's Americans up there as well, yeah. So when you go to the north edge of this base, you are the northernmost human being on the planet Earth. Jeez. And so, yeah, we got stuck up there for three extra days, and they, they were really working hard to keep us entertained, and they said, hey, well, would you, is there anything you'd like to do? Is there anything you'd like to see? And they were letting us drive all the vehicles, and we went with Environment Canada and drilled holes in the ice and released weather balloons. But every time they would ask if there's something else I wanted to do, I would always ask them to take me to the north end of the base again. <laughs> <laughs> because I just wanted to walk north past the group I was with and just stand there and think to myself, at this moment, I'm the northernmost human being on the planet Earth. So for me, that was that was a you know a really cool one. Um, I uh, I remember I was on a Black Hawk helicopter and it's very loud. You have you have earplugs in and you can't really talk. You can't hear anything. And the gunner in the Black Hawk helicopter turned to me and he made this this signal like get your camera ready. He's like get your camera out. So I get my back then it was 2010 or 2011. Um, and so I get my digital camera out. And when the Black Hawk turns. There's this giant structure and, and on the ground, and I don't know what it is, but it's this, like, massive, you know, oh, my goodness, what is that? So we land, and I ask the pilot, I go, what was that? And he goes, that's Babylon. Whoa. So if any of your listeners just Google, just Google Babylon, they've rebuilt it, so, like, Babylon, and then just go, go Google images, you will see this structure that we saw from the air in a Black Hawk helicopter. And in that moment, you're like, oh, like who gets 
who gets to see Babylon from the from the back of a Black Hawk helicopter? You know, so those are the ones where you really feel like you're doing something that's a little more important than just comedy. You know, you're you're helping the men and women who are over there pass an hour and a half. And, and you know, I, I thought before I went over for my first tour that it would be, I'm bringing them a piece of home or I'm helping them. That's really not what it is. When they're not on mission, it really, it's hard to keep your mind occupied. You're just sitting there watching DVDs. You're trying to, you know, they're playing basketball. They're going to the gym. But for that 90 minutes, you help them get closer to home. You help them get 90 minutes closer to their deployment being finished. And those, for me, are the, you know, the, the coolest. Um, you know, the last three tours that, that Joan Rivers did of Canada, I toured with Joan. And walking down a hallway and seeing Joan Rivers come the other way and saying, uh, hi, Joan, and her saying, hi, Lars, <laughs> and that she had just gotten in trouble for Good Morning America. And I go, uh, as we're passing each other to our dressing rooms, I go, in trouble again, hey? And she goes, what did I do this time? <laughs> <laughs> the, like, this moment of being on a first-name basis with the Tonight Show fill-in host for many years, Johnny Carson's right-hand person, being, you know, uh, Spaceballs. Like, Joan Rivers was the robot in Spaceballs. So yeah. <laughs> that, for me, uh, you know, I don't, I don't want to be an opening act. You know, I've been, you know, I've, everybody hopefully aspires to be a great headliner in their own right. But in those moments when you got to see how hard somebody like Joan worked or Bob Staggett or Jeff Foxworthy and how nice they are, those moments, you're like, this is, like, I never dreamed I would ever meet these people, let alone share a stage with them, you know, so, yeah. um, pretty amazing. Totally. How about the crazy shows? I mean, Canada's known for uh, some of the really backwoods, insane stuff. I've heard uh, some really fun uh, stories. Do you have any of those, like, shows that were, you know, 12 people in a wolf, as Daryl Lennox would say? <laughs> yeah. We, uh, so I remember once we did a show just outside of Medicine Hat, Alberta, which is down by Calgary, close to the Montana border for uh, for American geography. Yeah. And it was uh, just a community hall, and uh, uh, there was a dog outside that heckled my entire show. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, but, you know, there was a gig in a place called Dawson Creek, oh, which is, uh, you know, on the way to Alaska. It's on the Alaska Highway. Um, and we it's a Friday night, oil field town, very blue collar, and nobody in the bar knows that there's a comedy show. Me and a very funny comedian named Scott Belford um, you have to do a 90-minute show. I'm headlining it. And... Not one person in the bar knew there was comedy going on. Not one person was listening to a show. We have a sound system and a spotlight. Um, and two guys come in late and think it's jokey -okey. They think we're all taking turns telling jokes. So they come on the stage, and I have to physically prevent them from getting the microphone from me. Meanwhile, there's two guys sitting next to Scott Belford in the back who are like, I'm going to stab this guy after the show. I'm going to stab this guy after the show. <laughs> so other than having to, to physically wrestle audience members off to keep hold of the microphone so I can finish the show <laughs> and being threatened to be stabbed, I can't think of too many that are like that. Yeah. Hey, did it pay? <laughs> yeah, paid that, well. Then it was a great gig. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, who booked that? Exactly. Um, it was, uh, yeah, it was rough. There's, I, I mean, I've definitely had my share of moments on, on the road. You're... You know, you're in some small town, and, uh, you know, it's, uh, it's, it can be rough. But I think, you know, the Midwest, anywhere, you know, you're doing a triple run somewhere in the middle of yeah. middle of Montana or Idaho. You know, it's uh, it's all the same. I think crowds around the world, from Australia to, to Vietnam to Canada to the U.S., they're all the same. Yeah. And you've done the Southeast Asia stuff, too, you know. Yeah. Definitely. Tell me about uh, that. I'm yeah, really curious. I'd never talked to anybody about doing shows in front of that crowd. Yeah, so there's a real comedy scene in in Southeast Asia, all over Asia. So there's English-speaking comedy clubs in Singapore, Kuala Lumpur, Bangkok, Vietnam, um, Hong Kong, Korea. So they're, they're not just rooms that do comedy. 
they're actual comedy clubs. And so uh, Comedy Club Bangkok is a, a great club. Seats about 120, maybe 140 at the top end. And it fills with expats. So it's Americans and Canadians and British and Australians. And the, the club is incredible. They pack it out, and the audiences are there to laugh. So, I mean, they're some of the hottest crowds I've seen. The, the club is called the Crack House in Kuala Lumpur. Oh, wow. It's one of the hottest clubs I've ever played. Um, and run by a very funny comedian and his wife. So there's this guy named Rizal. And Rizal is a stone-cold killer. Like, the dude is so funny. And his club packed out. And I actually feel a little bit bad. I'll send him a link to your to your podcast so I didn't know that the headline spot was 30 minutes so in North America it's 45 to 60 minutes Yeah. so I didn't ask him before so I just assumed 45 but it could be 60 so I'm like ugh like I don't want to it's 45 minutes I don't want to go long I'm very pride myself on doing my time so I'm like okay well I'll just split the difference and do like 50 minutes because then you know 52 minutes I think I did the first night and like 50 minutes the next night because I don't want to seem like I'm going short if it's a 60 minute set yeah. I don't want to blow the light by a whole, whole bunch if it's because of 45 minutes that I should have asked. That's on me. But the crowds are amazing, and I finish, and finally, you know, Saturday night, we finished the last show. And I go, hey, how like, how long was I supposed to do? Because I, I assumed 45, but yeah. I didn't, you know, if it was 60, I apologize for shorting you a little bit. And he's like, oh, no, 30 minutes. Headline spots are 30 minutes. <laughs> I'm like, why would you have told me that? Yeah. And he goes, no, they were loving you. He goes, I, did, I wanted you to keep going. So nice. I felt like I pride myself on my time. I don't, I've never blown the light like 15 minutes in my life. Um, so that was my fault for not asking, but um, super fun club. And then Singapore uh, has both a comedy club and a guy who books comedy. There's a, a really great guy named Umar who, who runs um, comedy masala in Singapore. And again, it's all expats. You know, you, you go there and the good lights, good sound, packed crowds, all appreciate comedy and they're pretty savvy you know so oh, yeah. because they run it regularly the crowds are good like in bangkok the crowds are great in singapore and vietnam and thailand and um, my good friend angie um i was actually the first comedian she booked when she took over booking in vietnam and it was uh, it was re it's really fun to to see where she's grown everything they actually did if somebody um, is listening to this and they want to read about comedy in vietnam the New York Times did a piece on comedy in Vietnam, and it mentions all my friends who were over there, a uh, very funny guy named Ben and Angie and a whole bunch of other people. So, yeah, you show up there, and they're, they welcome you with open arms, great food, super cheap, dollar beers, and then, and then fantastic comedy shows. Of course, you know, somebody like Tom Rhodes has been doing that circuit for almost 20 years. Yeah. So he kind of, you know, he started it more than anybody. Is the, so I'm following the Tom Rhodes school of comedy, and then you get to go to Germany and and Amsterdam and, oh, and yeah. all these cool places to do comedy. Yeah, I saw these videos he did of doing comedy in Mongolia, and he just yeah. got to be good buddies with all these guys. He's like, hey, <laughs> Genghis Khan has over 15 million descendants. How you doing, cousin? And he was calling everybody <laughs> cousin. Oh, unbelievable. He's he's my... I always said if I had a dream show that I could book for myself, I'd have Tom Rhodes as the opener, then I'd have Dave Attell as the headliner, it'd be in the Comedy Cellar, and that'd just be the show. Nobody else on it. You gotta put yourself on it, man. Yeah, I, I mean, I would do the opening announcements, but... <laughs> Let's be honest, you got Tom Rhodes and Dave Attell, that's all you need on a comedy show. You know, a lot of people yeah, would say uh, George Carlin, Woody Allen, Chris, you know, p try to pack it. No, all you need is two comics and just have them do time. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, that's a hell of a lineup. Yeah, it's actually... I could watch that one all day. That, that's a good question. What would be your dream lineup? Mm. Like your dream show? So this... Yeah, so on my radio show, we ask this question of all of our guests. Um, and, and the question we ask is, Two comedians, you're on the bill, and the venue. And so my venue, hands down, has always been Carnegie Hall. So yeah. getting to play Carnegie Hall for me, when I see people who get to open for Gap again at Carnegie Hall or any of these people who get to play Carnegie Hall, I am um, a couple of the guys. I think Ted Alexander did it opening for uh, 
like Bill Burr or something. I am like so envious of of Carnegie Hall. Um, my dream show, uh, you know, I mean, Burr is so funny these days. I feel like Bill Burr is just at the top of his game. Um, yeah. But I would, uh, I would say Joan Rivers. All right. Um, and then, I mean, she was so ridiculously funny. Fun. So when she passed away, there was a lot of people she had used as opening acts. We all connected with each other and, and told stories and shared stories about her, about how kind and gracious she was. And one of the, if you get a chance, if you're interviewing Brad Upton oh, yeah. um, on your show, um, I'm sure he'd love to do it. Brad Upton, actually, you know, Brad Upton um, was a, a regular opening act and actually a writer as well for Joan. Um, oh, but wow. we just talk about how how gracious, how generous, how kind, how thoughtful. Like, the idea is, if you ever reached that level of fame, you know, I, I like the quote, I think it was a Kevin Spacey quote, unfortunately, but <laughs> if you reach the top, it's your job to send the elevator back down. So, so Joan always made sure that your name was on the promo. So if she was on a billboard and you were opening for her, your name was on that billboard. Oh, nice. The star on your dressing room was the same as the star on her dressing room. And so all of these little things, she did your introduction. She would come on and say, your opening act tonight, da-da-da-da. It wasn't pre-recorded. She did it live. And Joan Rivers doing your introduction to her crowd, you were legitimized before you got on stage. They're like, oh, this is a friend of Joan Rivers. Okay, we'll listen to this guy. So all of those little things she did made her just truly one of the most my favorite people that I've ever worked with. And everybody who's ever worked with her has a story that's similar to that. I'm sure Brad will have a bunch. And there was one story, uh, there was a, a comedian who was opening for her and her mom came back to meet Joan Rivers and she said to Joan Rivers, oh, that's a really nice watch. And Joan just took off her watch and gave it to her. She's like, no, no, I don't. And she's like, no, take it. It's for my Home Shopping Network show. I want you to have it. Like Joan would give you the shirt off her back. Wow. And so, yeah, so I put, I put Joan on the show for sure. And then, oh man, uh, you know, I mean, I, I'm not a, I wasn't a massive Carlin fan. I think he's one of the greatest of all time. Yeah. But I don't know if I would. Uh, <clears throat> Chappelle's cliche. How about a, Chris Rock? How about Irwin? Yeah, Irwin. Sure, Irwin is a great choice for for the listeners who don't know Irwin Barker. In Canada, we basically called him good choice. By the way. Yeah. Um, we called him the professor. He was the smartest writer the funniest comedian and like i i yeah i could listen i actually oh erwin was a, is a great choice um yeah yeah, yeah sure i'll do that joan erwin also wrote for joan yeah um erwin and brad upton for me are both very similar styles just so smart and so uh, economical with the use of their words they're precise these are just great comics and so um yeah, good choice. I'll go with Erwin. I, I, yeah. <laughs> nice work, Seth. Erwin Barker, <laughs> one of the greats. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> yeah. to, give, to give people an idea of Erwin's material, he has this great joke where he goes, if you look up potato in the dictionary, it should just say, you know, potato. <laughs> yeah. It says, fernacious tuber. Like, if you don't know what a potato is, <laughs> It's, it's great. Yeah, like I, I called a taxi. Uh, I, call, oh, <laughs> I called a taxi, and the person, the, <laughs> the dispatcher said, "It'll be there in no time." That means it's either already here <laughs> or it's not coming. <laughs> yeah. yeah, he's fantastic. Yeah, he had that one where he's talking about uh, the opening airplane announcement. It's like, "This is your captain, Captain Rogers." Uh, why is that useful information? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> It's like, oh, fantastic. I'll go to a drive through It's like, hey, can I take your order? Hey, is that Captain Rogers? It's me, Irwin, C-25D. <laughs> so funny. And uh, yeah. um, he passed away from, from cancer, and they did a documentary about it. I don't know if it's available online somewhere, or maybe it's on YouTube, um, on Irwin Barker, and it was called That's My Time. So he had terminal cancer, and for the yeah. last year, this documentary crew followed him around. And I, I think that that name for that documentary about Erwin Barker was perfect. I wish he was still around, but um, That's My Time is oh, the, the perfect title. Oh, definitely. In fact, um, <clears throat> I heard a story how uh, 
once he got diagnosed, he couldn't tour the states anymore, because uh, for people to for comics to tour the states, especially from Canada with an illness, you need an insurance company to uh, sponsor you, and he couldn't get yeah. one. So uh, yeah, I believe that it was uh, yeah. It, it, he's he was a great loss, and and somebody the Canadian comedians to a to a man and a woman revere him. We. We, yep. you know, he, he became the name on the trophy for the comedy competition that used to exist at Just for Laughs called Homegrown. It was the Erwin Barker Memorial Trophy, and uh, and uh, he just just fantastic, just one of the best yeah. human beings you've ever met. And I actually, fun little side note, I, I emailed him when I had a day job. I was probably two or three uh, three years into comedy, and I emailed him and said, "Hey, I'm such a big fan. Do you have any advice?" Da, 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 da. And he emailed me back. So I emailed him through his website. He's like, you know, write and edit and get on stage as much as you can. And, um, yeah, so I, wow. I was I was a fan of his, you know, forever. He, he's great. Good choice. Yeah, definitely. There's only one argument I have with your show, and that's the venue, Carnegie Hall, because high ceilings are not conducive to good comedy. Mm-hmm. So I think that one of the best openings of an album was Ray Romano. Ray Romano came on when he recorded his album at Carnegie Hall. And as most people know, Ray Romano is a very clean comedian, really didn't swear in any of his act. And when he came on to Carnegie Hall, he said, you'll have to excuse me for a moment. Carnegie fucking Hall. Nice. <laughs> so for me, the the reverence that I have, and when I was a kid growing up, you know, the how do you get to Carnegie Hall? Practice, yeah. practice, practice. Yeah. The Carnegie Hall was the be-all and end-all of venues for me growing up. There wasn't, uh, you know, there was no, so few comedians had ever played yeah. Madison Square Garden, you know. The first time a comedian sold out Madison Square Garden, um, it was, you know, Andrew Dice Clay, I think, might have been the first one. I may, I Maybe Richard Pryor. Might have, I don't know if Pryor ever hmm. sold out stadiums. Yeah. He might have. He, Maybe. he may very well have. And so. Maybe Steve anyway, Martin. But yeah. Yeah, and so for me, or I don't even know if Madison Square Garden was around when he was doing stadiums, but anyway, um, the idea of Carnegie Hall was it for me growing up. And my parents were musicians, so there was this, I'm like, that is the place. So I agree with you, it's not, I do think comedy needs to be intimate. You know, a place yep. like the Comedy Underground in Seattle is this low ceiling, a little bit in your face, like, it needs to be cool it needs to be grunge it needs to be it, you need to feel like you're in a speakeasy in order for yeah. comedy to be right and, and so i agree with you that it's for comedy not an ideal venue but as far as um, it being iconic in my mind there's nothing bigger there's there's not a venue in the world if carnegie hall listens to your podcast and they need an opening act for uh, for somebody um uh, maybe the grand old opry I'd love that that'd oh. be one. Brad Upton's been playing the Grand Old Opry lately. Yeah, Mary Mack did it too. Yeah, so oh. so the Grand Old Opry is one. My parents being country musicians, I like. Yeah, I mean that's that's one that I would. That would. That would yeah, definitely oh. envious of that one. Not the Rogers Center. <laughs> no, I have no desire to. I mean, it'd be it'd be kind of fun. Yeah. You know, in Steve Martin's book Born Standing Up, he talks about um, he talks about. When it gets to that size, you're just kind of hosting a party. Yeah. Like you're not really doing comedy anymore. You're just, everybody just wants to say they saw you. Like when people go see Kevin Hart, they don't want to, you know, they're not necessarily looking for this edgy comedy that's going to be, that's going to be funny. They're looking for, hey, I went and saw Kevin Hart. Like it's, you're hosting a party at that point. Yeah. Steve Martin said that well. I think it's to the point where you don't have to handle a bachelorette party that you know if you get to a venue to that size where they got people to handle it not you you're good you know that's when you achieve yeah. super fame yeah now there's this funny story so kermit appeal was headlining laughs and kermit uh you know kermit he's as good as it gets top notch great comic and he opens for Brian Regan sometimes. Well, Regan was in Seattle doing a, uh, he was doing a uh, corporate, 
And he asked Kermit, hey, could I do some time on your show? And Kermit's like, are you kidding? Come on over, definitely. <laughs> so, so Brian Regan comes, and during his set, Kermit says, we got a great, great, amazing comic here. He's going to just stop and do a little time. Brian Regan. So Brian Regan goes on stage, and they do a check drop during <laughs> Regan's time. <laughs> Literal uh, for the viewers not big fans. Check drop is when they uh, drop the checks to the audience to uh, you know build them for the food and drinks. But Regan said that was his first check drop in like fifteen years. <laughs> Just, that entertains me to no end. Oh, definitely, it's now we're talking about big venues. Do you have a number on the most audience members like? your biggest venue that you performed in front of? Yeah, I mean, I did a, I've done a show outside, so 7 billion. That, were you the most northernmost comic <laughs> performing for everybody? <laughs> uh, yeah, I, uh, yeah, I mean, I can't, like, you know, I worked, uh, you know. I can't imagine the check drop for that show. <laughs> yeah. Well, there's a, a two-drink maximum on the military base up there, so. Oh, nice. um, yeah, yeah, so you, you, it's tough for you to even get drunk. Um, but uh, probably the biggest show, uh, I mean, when you tour with Jonas, like over 2,000 every show. Oh, totally. Um, the, on the cruise ships, when you do the Welcome Aboard show, you know, you're usually doing it to 2,500 or 3,000. Um, trying to think of, like, the biggest. Uh... Yeah, I mean, probably 2,500 is, is probably the biggest, and, and that was always as an opening act for somebody famous, you know. Yeah. Um, I just did a theater show in Edmonton, where I live. Um, I recorded a new album in the middle of November, and I sold out a 700-seat theater, which was, um, I, so, <laughs> I, I think that in order to be a comedian, you have to have some humility. And so, oh, no doubt. when I rented this theater to, re to record this album, and especially Canadian, you can't toot your own horn. Looks bad on looks bad. Um, so I rented this theater, and how the theater is set up is there's a 500 seat lower bowl and a 200 seat balcony. So my idea was that I just open the lower bowl. I don't have to pay for extra ushers. I, I can usually sell three to four hundred tickets in Edmonton. I'm not like Edmonton famous, and that's you're using air quotes. Yeah. Um, and so I get a phone call from the venue, and they're like, "Hey, we're sold out. You want to open the balcony?" And I was like, um, say what? <laughs> and they're like, we're, we're sold out. Like, did you want to open the balcony? And now I have to pay whatever, a couple extra hundred bucks to pay for the ushers for the balcony. But I was like, we're sold out. I'm like, how much? Like the 500? And they're like, yeah. And I was nice. like, what? So I, I, I'm like, I, I'm like, there's that. They're like, yeah. So, yeah. So I guess of my own, of my own doing, a uh, 700 seater, which is, which blows my mind. I, yeah. I don't mean to sound so surprised, but I but I really was. Oh, it's commendable. <laughs> and, <700. you> know, <laughs> like, I'm like, uh, okay, yeah. And so I had another comedian ask me, he was like, oh, so how much, how much do you pay for, you know, how pay for give away free tickets? And I'm like, none. I didn't give away any. Wow. So we sold all 700. And I'm like, this is, so to this day, you know, three, four months later, I'm still shaking my head like, I can't believe, I can't believe that we sold this out. Um, so yeah, it was, uh, that's probably the biggest one of my own, but you know, on somebody else's coattails, definitely done more than, more than uh, 2,000 a bunch of times. Yeah, but I'm sure your viewing audience on Comic Genius, your local, uh, is it local or is it internet, like, how does that work? Tell me, uh, tell me about your thing. <laughs> Which, what was the question, sorry? Comic Genius, tell me about your thing, how, what's your viewership or listenership, because... You know, if, so, if you're like that, I assume a lot of them are fans of the show. Yeah, so our radio show, 14 years ago, um, I had an idea to start a local radio show. And um, it was mainly just to promote my comedian friends that I was fond of. And so it's Wednesdays at, at midnight, so if anybody's listening to this today, it'll be um, 11 p.m. California time, it'll be midnight mountain standard time um it's a show called comic genius and genius is spelled with a j which makes me laugh because it's a it's an 
you know, an auditory medium and I have a visual joke. So it's hilarious to me on many levels where yeah. you're spelling genius wrong, but also people can't see the joke because it's, you know, brutal. They're listening to it. So comic genius with a J. There are a lot of the episodes are up on comic genius. .ca. We also have comicgenius.com, and again, Comic Genius with a J. But started the show really just kind of to, to promote musicians and comedians that I liked. And we've been nominated for a couple of Canadian Comedy Awards, one best non commercial radio show in Edmonton one year, which was also a surprise. Um, yes. So, yeah, it's, it's something I'm really proud of. Um, I handed it off officially a couple of years ago. After doing it for 12 years, I handed it to my very good friend, Norm Shaw. And so he's been the official host, and um, I sit in whenever I'm in town. Um, but it's, it's uh, yeah, it's something I'm really proud of. Um, <laughs> you know, it's, uh, it's a, a good show, and it's a couple hours long. And, you know, the, I, I was always against putting it online after the fact. It's something that the entire time I did it, I'd never put it online. I yeah. like the idea of doing the radio show and just having it released into the cosmos. Not, you know, there's no no record of it. It's just once it's done, it's done. People, they, they didn't hear it live. Um, yeah. After Norm took it over, he started podcasting them. So he, he started putting them online, and so there's a whole lot of episodes up now, but that was his doing, and I'm glad he did, um, yeah. recording them for some sort of posterity. And he has a pretty good listenership. We have a pretty good listenership. So we've had Doug Stanhope's done it, and uh, um, Bobcat Goldthwait, um you know, uh, Peter Bob Gray Sega did a little. Yeah, Peter Gray's definitely done. It. He's been live in studio a couple times. Oh. Yeah, big fan of uh, big fan of Peter Gray's definitely. Was, so yeah, hey, uh, Pete. Seth, Seth has done it. Seth, I think Seth has called. Have you called into my radio show? I've, I think so. I tweeted at you guys, but I've never called in. No, yeah, okay. Well, we'll have you as a guest. Oh, I got nothing better um, to do. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, um, it really, you know, I. I, I've never had a fan page. You know, if people want to find me on social media, it's just Instagram and Twitter, extra Lars, E-X-T-R-A Lars. Yep. Um, and so, I, I don't know. I, the idea of having a fan page always made me look cool. And that's why podcasting, I felt the same way. as like, I'll let other people do that. I, you know, I'll just do the radio show, promote the people I love. Oh, and, totally. And then let it be done. So, yeah. And... So uh, when you have venture, uh, it's, we're getting to the 33-minute mark, so I'm going to start wrapping it up. Uh, when's your next venture to the States? Well, well uh, after I home from Australia. Yeah, so... Oh, um, we'll talk about that after this. <laughs> um, so I'm under a 14-day quarantine, and then, you know, as far as when live performances... And comedy clubs open back up. Who knows? Um, yeah. You know, I, I don't have I don't have kids, and I, um, you know, I'm, so I'm going to be doing a telethon, I think, um, to raise money for entertainers with children who are, you know, missing some income at this time. Yep. Um, but it's uh, yeah, I mean, I have no idea when my next show is anywhere. I was uh, supposed to be on tour in in Australia and Asia for the next four months. So we came we came home when our prime minister said, "Time for you guys to get back." To Trudeau taking money from your pockets once again. <laughs> yeah. So, what are the crowds like in Australia? Well, yeah, this is it. They're they're exactly the same as Canada. They are so spookily similar, eerily similar to Canadian audiences. <laughs> so it's a the Australia became a country in 1901. Canada became one in 1867. So we're about the same age as far as a country. We're both Commonwealth countries, so we're, we have a real British influence. So there's this sarcastic wit that exists. Like, Daryl Lennox always did really well in Canada because of the, the how intellectual his comedy is. Yeah. And so there's this, this, like, sarcastic undertone in Canadian and Australian comedy. So if you're a Canadian comedian and you go there, it's super, it translates so easily um, into, you know, the same kind of sensibilities. And then, the you know, the first bunch of years I did, you know, the comedy festival, so the Adelaide Fringe Festival, the Melbourne Comedy Festival. Yeah. Um, and then there was one in Tasmania that I did. And so because you're at a comedy festival and people are coming with the comedy festival attitude, 
it's a little different than just a normal club. So there's just a little more reverence. There's they're they're there as kind of theater crowds or pseudo theater crowds, and so you, you really have their undivided attention, and and it's super super great crowds. So yeah, I found it to be so similar to Canada in in their sense of humor that it just played very well. And uh, I've done I don't know probably four four hundred shows in Australia. Jeez. And I've been really yeah really lucky as far as um, you know. I have a good friend in Chris Franklin who's a who's a celebrity. In Australia, actually, you know what? If if your listeners want something else, once they've worked their way through all of your podcasts, Chris Franklin and Ari Shafir. So if they want to familiarize themselves with Chris Franklin, yeah. he's the first Australian to get scurvy in like a hundred years. <laughs> <laughs> he, drank, he drank so much and ate so few vegetables that he went to the doctor because he wasn't feeling well, and the doctor's like, "You have scurvy." <laughs> Like that's a real thing that happened. Um, so, um, uh, if you're uh, if any of your listeners are on Twitter, go to at bloke b l o k e bloke Franklin and tell him you heard me talking about him on Um He's just on Twitter; he's not on Instagram. But um, yeah, so look up Chris Franklin and Ari Shapir. They that that podcast is a good listen as well. And so he set me up with a lot of different shows all over Australia. And so I've done, you know, I've done every state in Australia except for one, which mm. uh, we were almost going to get to do this time around. So hopefully we get back there. And then, uh, then I was supposed to be off to Asia for four or five weeks. Instead, we just after you know ten days into the tour, we just turned around and came home. It was uh, it was very unexpected, and and now I'm uh, doing Seth's podcast from Edmonton, Canada. Yeah, unexpectedly. Why not? Now, last question. Have you checked off all the provinces? Have you performed in every province and territory in Canada? I'm missing one. Ooh, Nunavut? No, actually, Alert, where the North Pole is, is in Nunavut. So I got to cross that one off in December. Oh, nice. Good guess, though. Good guess. Um, I have been to Newfoundland as a child. I have not performed there as a comedian. Ooh. Yeah, yeah I'm... so... I mean, it's best to just let it happen organically. Don't try to... Because no one really, <laughs> I was talking to, with Kermit about this, about because he's done 47 of the states, and yeah. it happened organically, but then he, he realized that it's just pompous to do it, just to say you've done it. It's best to let it happen organically. It's like having a degree, a PhD, but it's not in medicine. Yeah, you know. that's fair. I'll, I'll give you that. I, I, I agree with that, and... So for the, the American listeners who might not be all that familiar with Newfoundland, so there's an, an island off the east coast of Canada called Newfoundland. And if any of your listeners are familiar with the Broadway play Come From Away, so Come From Away tells the story of all the planes that had to land on the east coast of Canada during 9-11. It's a, it's a Tony Award-winning Broadway play. And so all of these planes land... Um, in Newfoundland, and then all of these people who we call Newfies, not, I mean, it's not necessarily derogatory, but, but people from Newfoundland, we, Canadians for the past hundred years have called them Newfies. It, it's so, like calling someone from Wisconsin a cheesehead. Yeah, yeah, it's yeah. Not, not insulting, but it's not. But anyway, so all of these people of Newfoundland went down and took all of these other people home. They took them into their homes and they, you know, took care of them while the planes were all grounded for 9-11. Wonderful play. I saw it in New York this past summer. And so um, that's the only one I'm missing, and it's about a 10-hour ferry ride or, you know, a two, two-and-a-half-hour flight from uh, two-hour flight from the mainland of Canada, and you go up to Newfoundland, and that's the last one, and I'm, I'm going to cross it off this year. As, as pretentious as that might be, I, uh, that's my goal, uh, yeah. to Iceland and, and cross off Newfoundland. And, Maybe I can stop at Newfoundland on the way to Iceland and get all the land crossed off. Hit up Greenland. Hit up the uh, Nuke uh, Chuckle Hut. We did, uh, so we on the way to the North Pole, I, I flew through Thule, Greenland. You guys have a military base up there. They actually do comedy at. So I haven't performed in Greenland, but I was there um, for one night, and I got very drunk with a bass player from a band called Ambush. <laughs> um, and then the, the Herc ride, the C-130 ride, C-17, C, yeah, C-130, um, 
that we rode the next day. If you are hungover, I do not recommend riding on a Herc. <laughs> Ooh. Yeah. Make sure you have a big breakfast. A lot of fiber. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. All right. Lars, I'm going to end this here. Lars, always a pleasure. Check out uh, at Extra Lars at, on Twitter. Check out his Facebook page. Um, Comic Genius, he's on there a lot with the J. Com it's C O M I C J E N I U S. That's the yeah. A dot com, whatever. And uh, yeah, just if he's around, hang out with him. He's one of my favorite people. Thanks for being on. Oh, the feelings mutual. Thank you for having me. Oh, no problem.